Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. It will be the last time this summer that I'm taping from here in my New York office. Um, quick recap on that. The Bonson Group has opened offices here in New York City um, at Fifth Avenue at uh, intersecting with 42nd Street in Midtown Manhattan. Opened the office about four months ago to have a place to work as our uh, business out here in the tri-state area has grown so much over the last several years. Um, home base is and will continue to be Newport Beach. I head back there with my family tomorrow night, but I've been working from New York City all summer, uh, largely to give my kids the experience of being here in Manhattan and uh, just really had an incredible amount of work projects to complete over the summer and feel very good about what we got done. Uh, and, and so, yeah, we head back to the home base, Newport Beach. Our, our uh, team is running on all cylinders right now. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've added a new member to our operations team, and we introduce uh, Camille uh, more formally in our written Dividend Cafe, which I hope you'll read at DividendCafe.com. So operations team growing and a lot of fun things happening. In the meantime, our, our New York office is up and running, and uh, whenever I'm out here, this is where I'll be working. But I've got a chance to videotape the Dividend Cafe from this spot several times throughout the summer. And, and uh, so I don't imagine most of you viewing care much where we tape from, but that's kind of the reason for the change of scenery. Um, let me tell you what I kind of want to cover here this week. The uh, market as I'm taping here on Thursday is up about 120 points net net on the week. It's actually a bigger move from bottom to top because... Uh, we did open down 150 points one particular day, I believe it was Tuesday, um, and, and made all of that back in the same day. So net-net from where we started the week to where we are now, we're up a little bit. And that's kind of interesting because you had this really just extraordinarily traumatic event around Hurricane Harvey that continues to be wreaking havoc throughout uh, much of eastern and south Texas. But then you have uh, the incident with North Korea firing a missile that actually went over Japanese airspace the other the other day, and and I, I think that to me is a very interesting part of this market resilience as well is to see kind of where we've come from, from where Trump's fire and fury comment, President Trump's fire and fury comment a couple of weeks ago, and the market shenanigans around North Korea fears uh, to where now markets entirely willing to shrug off um, what appears to be just more jaw boning and things like that. Uh, the markets um, are not responding to Hurricane Harvey because they generally don't. When you talk about markets as global as they are, equities, currencies, fixed income, interest rates, um, and, and even apart from international uh, realities of markets, but even just the broad domestic economy, the reality is that there's an amazing and just simply surreal, painful impact that's going to be felt into uh, that regional area, um, but on a national level, not, not something that we think will really move the needle. Did a lot of research on it this week. I went back and really looked over a lot of the data coming out of Hurricane Katrina. And just like this week, gas prices did move a little bit. Uh, oil and natural gas prices didn't move. The media talked a lot about refiners, uh, just as they have this week. But really, this is a human story, and any attempt to make it a market story is just wrong. You could have two or three days of volatility around a particular aspect of it. There are some that want to view it opportunistically, like is retail sales going to have to go higher as that region is rebuilt, or industrial production activity. I think that there's a sense in which it could, but again, it's regional and therefore not needle moving on a national basis. It's not an investable event, either defensively or opportunistically. Uh, it's a human event and a tragic one at that. And I mean this, that our, uh, our thoughts and prayers are not only with all of the, the Texas-based clients of the Bonson Group, but all those uh, in the region impacted. Uh, just an absolutely surreal thing to witness. And um, our prayers go r r really fervently with, with those in need of, of help at this time. The other aspect of markets this week that I think is a little less timely and a little bit more um, kind of strategic around what we're looking to do portfolio positioning wise is continued study that I'm quite heavily engaged in right now uh, around Japan. 
And um, I don't imagine that there'll be anything actionable in the next several weeks, um, potentially a month or two. But what I'm looking at right now is taking a 20 year bearish thesis that I've had, um, wherein Japan's market has not gone up at all in 20 years, has had a lot of gyrations along the way. But as a result of being in a deflationary spiral coming out of a um, bubble in the late 80s that went from a, a price inflation bubble to an asset inflation bubble, and then has resulted in this nasty uh, deflationary cycle and has resulted in, in a very, very long hangover. And um, right now we are believing opportunity to surface on a bottom up basis and select companies in Japan that are responding to their need to be attractive to investors, to, to uh, grow a capital base, to generate capital formation around what is a very profitable endeavor through the uh, permanent attractiveness of growing dividends. So this is the thesis that we invest upon in the United States and we see it becoming more in vogue in Japan because Japan can have demographic challenges, which they do, and debt challenges, which they do, but there are still incredible operators in Japan, but it's select. And so we have to be kind of uh, careful as to how we approach it. But um, I'm doing my homework and that's something we continue to look at. Um, I give you some statistics at dividendcafe.com this week. Uh, Japanese companies have actually now over the last three years outpaced the S&P in annual dividend growth, meaning the growth of the income that they're paying out has been higher than the S&P 500. So uh, more on that. Um, a couple anecdotal things that are mentioned on the uh, uh, written article this week. Mortgage extraction is something I'm starting to have to watch quite closely. It is not at a level that is concerning me. It is in a trajectory that is concerning me. The trend of people that are extracting equity out of their homes again, either through cash out refinances or home equity line withdrawals um, is, is moving significantly higher. It's now back up to a, a high that it's been since the financial crisis, not even close to where it was in the embarrassingly cartoonish and dangerous and what proved to be catastrophic levels of 2002 to 2006. But nevertheless, seeing this behavior again is something we wanna monitor for a number of reasons. Uh, primarily the fact that um, as a trend, not in isolated cases where it could be perfectly responsible um, borrowing. Well, what I'm referring to is as a trend nationally and in, in an aggregate situation. Uh, are we are we threatening the stability? Um, are we are we adding to the fragility of the national financial system and housing market? Um, I'm going to leave you with this comment: the global coordinated growth, the 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 um, fact that right now you are seeing better than we've seen real economic growth here in the United States still has a ways to go to become substantive and create another leg to a bull market. Europe is still rather tepid, but nevertheless off the zero bound level to been at for several years. Same with Japan. China's softening um, has been much more muted than have been feared. And then emerging markets all over the, the world have done quite well. But, but when you get all these things together, you have something going on right now we haven't seen in over 10 years. And that is that every sector um, geographically of the global economy is pointing to some degree of positive growth. Uh, some may be in slow growth, some may be in more tepid growth, but none are in that contraction phase. And that is by far to me the most significant issue of driving earnings. We have a global economy, companies that sell to global customers, generating a higher revenue base and, and peak margins that are creating very nice earnings. But this global reflation is alive and well, creating a lot of uh, profits and opportunities in markets for investors. Um, now, are there plenty of black swan events or unforeseen events or, or things that no one's talking about that could happen? There's plenty of risks. There's valuation stories. My point in this 10 minute video is just simply to say 
that that's the reason markets are going and the chart you will see um, in Dividend Cafe really illustrates it well. We covered a couple other topics, by the way, this week that I won't get into now in the video. A little talk on Bitcoin, a little talk on household formation, which I think is a very important both economic and cultural story. Um, natural gas exports and kind of a, a thesis behind that that is really, I think, fascinating. But I need to leave it there. I've been going on too long. So I'm going to be back with you next week. Uh, with USC 1-0, because they will start their season this weekend as the greatest time of year launches, college football. My beloved Trojans will start off with a victory, and then I'll give you another Dividend Cafe video next week back in beautiful Newport Beach, California. Thanks for listening to this week's Dividend Cafe.